Welcome, book nerds. Today, I'm interviewing author Paulina Simons about her newest romance title, The Tiger Catcher. Stay tuned. Hey, everyone. I am your host, Tamara Ford, and thank you for downloading this week's book chat here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. Every week we get bookish with roundtable book discussions, five-minute shelf bites, interviews, and more. Subscribe to our newsletter so that you don't miss out on any of this book nerd awesomeness. If you'd like to email in feedback or questions, reach out to me at info at shelfaddiction.com or call in and leave an internet voice message via SpeakPipe. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Shelf Addiction. The links for everything related to today's episode, including Paulina's social media, are below in the show notes. If you know someone who may enjoy this episode, please share it with them today. Before we get started, let me tell you a bit about today's interview guest. Paulina Simons is the author of Tully, The Bronze Horseman, and 11 additional titles, as well as two children's books, a cookbook, and a memoir. Her books have been published in over 23 countries and have been on many bestseller lists around the world. Born in La Grande, Russia, Paulina immigrated to the United States in the mid-70s and now lives in New York with her husband and half of her children. I was pleased to have the opportunity to interview Paulina Simons, and I know you'll enjoy this conversation. Let's jump into the interview. Hey, Paulina, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Tamara. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. I'm so excited to talk about your new trilogy and the first book, The Tiger Catcher. But first, let's talk a little bit about you. Are you ready to jump in? Absolutely. Ask away. All right. So share with us what books you're reading right now. Well, books I'm reading right now, well, um, my own, uh, because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in a, in a, in a horrible time crunch because we are, you know, publishing them so quickly that I, I'm spending all my time trying to, uh, either proofread one or copy edit another. And so all my time is, is, um, you know, is taken up, is taken up with that. But in the meantime, I'm also, when I have a few seconds, I'm also, uh, I just finished um, the subtle art of not giving a um, mm, yes mm, yeah that one that was a that was a very enjoyable book and I'm also reading an old um, uh, book of George Orwell's um, his, one of his book of essays called Down and Out in Paris and London I really like that and I'm reading also a book of poems by Leonard Cohen called The Book of Longing because that's something I mm. can do even while I'm working on my own stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So are there any books or authors you say that may have influenced your writing style over time? I think everything that I read influences me one way or another. Either I say, oh, I really love that, or I say I would like not to do that. So one way or another, I'm always learning, I guess I would say, from everything that I everything that I read. Um, but I, I very much like my, you know, my Russian authors, uh, sort of, I, I feel in Russian. And so when I read their words, I try to see if there's a way to make those feelings, um, translate, uh, vividly into, into English. So I very Mm -hmm. much enjoy, uh, reading Dostoevsky and, and, um, Pasternak and also Bulgakov and, um, uh, Tolstoy, of course, for that sort of thing. Would you recommend those same books for others or would you recommend something else? Oh, I would very much recommend, usually the translation is a problem, but I would, I would definitely recommend uh, Anna Karenina by Tolstoy, very much so. And I, and I would uh, recommend Master and Margarita by Bulgakov. I don't necessarily think I would recommend Dr. Zhivago. I think probably uh, the movie, watching the movie might be okay. (laughs) Sometimes Uh, those adaptations are good. Yeah, they're excellent. But in English, I mean, look, you have many wonderful authors in English that I've read that have deeply, uh, deeply, uh, you know, affected me. I love, uh, for example, I love Dickens's humor that I could write with as much humor as he writes. And I also love Victor Hugo's, um, incredibly expressive way with words. Like when you read him, it's like every page is just poetry. 
So I very much enjoy that. Oh, very nice. Okay, so let's talk about your trilogy. I would love to know what inspired this trilogy. How did the end of forever manifest? So it came, uh, it manifested itself uh, all at once. Um, I think that I was um, I was uh, in a movie theater watching something that I did not enjoy, and my mind wandered. <laughs> And it was during the trailers that my mind wandered. So I knew that the movie was, you know, I don't even know. I think it was, I I don't even know. It was, um, it wasn't, uh, I have a feeling that it wasn't something very good. But I, I saw uh, the, the, the shape of the story uh, from the very beginning, the entire shape of it. I didn't know it was going to be this huge. I didn't know it was going to be uh, this epic, but what I saw was, um, Julian, my main character, and I saw his love, and I saw his desperate, desperate need to to find the woman that he loved and lost. Aww. <laughs> well, you, I think in the first book, you definitely nailed his desperation. That is for sure. He is desperate, man. We can talk about yeah. him a little bit later. Since you mentioned that you were inspired by this huge, vast story, and you also mentioned that you are reading those books right now, let's talk a little bit about how those books are being published okay. since we're on the topic. Uh, the first book is available now, and the second and third will be available within 12 months. How is that possible, <laughs> well, Paulina? Because it doesn't usually happen, and the reason it, the reason it doesn't usually happen is because um, most people write one book at a time. It just so happens that I spent the last five years working on these three books, and so when I submitted them, I submitted them all at once. I said, "This is what I've got. I've got this whole thing. This is my story," and so we. Uh, tried, um, you know, to figure out how best to publish it. You know, originally we did think that we would publish it maybe one a year. Um, we thought maybe breaking it up into novellas. We thought of, of you know, many things. And then in the end we said, well, you know, we live in a binge-watching generation. People, you know, watch Game of Thrones. They watch Breaking Bad. They watch The Americans, right? They watch The Crown, all of it at once. Give it to me. Give it to me now. And we thought, well, what about a book for the binge reading generation? Because I'm what I'm hoping is that when you read The Tiger Catcher, what you will want is more. And I know from my own personal mm-hmm. experience and the experience of people who have read the book that when you read A Beggar's Kingdom, The only thing you want is the third book. And so for the fact that you don't, Mm -hmm. you're not going to have to wait for that a year, which is what the norm is, um, I think it's going, I'm hoping that it's going to be astonishing. I do think it will be because as a hardcore series reader, there is nothing more than you want than the next book, especially like the minute you shut that book, you're like, where's the next one? And to wait a whole 12 months for another one, it's like painful sometimes. It really is. I agree. We appreciate it. Right. I agree. And you're right. And you're welcome. And that's only because I, I happen to write them and finish them. And so we had this entire opus that we could figure out how to publish. Had we done a more traditional a way of where I just submitted the first book and said, okay, well, this is what I've got, then we wouldn't have had this opportunity. We wouldn't have had this chance to do something really special with the books. Now, like I said, it's not, it's not easy, you know, to publish three books in one year. That's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. Let me just say that Tamara, but uh, at the same time, it's so exciting. And it means also that for the year, for the entire 2019, like my book is, my my three books are going to be in the front of people's minds, in the front of bookstores, you know, we're going to be talking about them online, hopefully, there's going to be a tour, there's going to be a block tour, like, it's just, it's, it's exciting. It's yeah. exciting to do it this way. Absolutely. Uh, the first book, The Tiger Catcher, uh, comes in at, at a hefty 464 pages in paperback. What made you guys decide on three instead of like a few more smaller segments of the book? That's uh, funny. I I I thought you were being ironic no. because <laughs> no because somebody said to me Paulina 
I saw your first book and it looks so short. How many pages is it? And I said, well, it's like 450 pages. And the woman said to me, oh, thank God it's not that short because it looked really, really short. Oh, no. And you, <laughs> well, because, because if you looked at any of my other books, uh, I have very few books that are that short. All of my books are much, much longer than that. Oh, much really? longer. Oh. oh, much longer. I have one book that's a thousand pages. Oh, I have gosh. another book that's 800 <laughs> pages. Most of my books, this is probably my second shortest book that I've ever written. Oh, wow. See, this is my <laughs> first time reading you. So this is a shocker to me. Okay. Usually I read books that come in between 375 and 400. So I was like, oh, this is a little chunkier. <laughs> Oh, but I liked it. It was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it it is what you're used to. I mean, if you're used to absolutely, if you're used to reading books that are more compact, certainly it'll seem maybe a bit more expansive to you. But Tamara, then you don't want to, you know, once you pick up the Beggar's Kingdom, a Beggar's Kingdom, you're going to be like, whoa, whoa, (laughs) (laughs) because that's um, that's that's quite a bit. Uh, bigger than uh, than the tiger catcher. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I got to prepare myself for that one when I decide to <laughs> dive on in. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's talk about your main characters. Um, what I enjoyed about this book was how realistically flawed they all were, really, yes. especially Julian and Josephine. So let's talk about them a yes. little bit. What did you keep in mind when creating them? Well, what I kept in mind is that we had to start the story Um, from a place where they are, as most people are, imperfect people that are striving, perhaps striving to be better. I mean, you could argue that maybe they're not striving as much as they should. (laughs) Uh, That certainly probably is the case for some of them, right? We, we, We can agree that they're imperfect and they're striving less than they ought to strive Mm -hmm. to be better. But what I wanted to do was I didn't want to make them sort of idealized because they needed the story needed to go somewhere we needed to uh, travel with them we needed to progress with them uh down the story of their life so that by the time we got to the end it meant something to us perhaps they changed perhaps they didn't change perhaps they became better or worse but there had to be a starting point as and as with all fiction Mm -hmm. You know, it needs to be in all of my other books. My characters are I mean, I like to make them complex, flawed, um, perhaps, um, you know, not again, like I said, not idealized, because to me, that seems more human and more relatable Mm -hmm. uh, in in many ways. And this is what my readers uh, tell me that they respond to, that the characters seem like like characters that they can identify with. Mm -hmm. Because they do seem so, so human. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the first um, part of the book, I was really thrown back by some of the stuff that Josephine did. I'm like, wow, she is a hot mess. Now you think Julian is bad, but man, Josephine is really hot mess. (laughs) Um, and I, yeah. I loved it. It was exciting to read. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, what's next? What she's, you know, what's going to happen? And that, I found that um, really entertaining. Well, actually, I'm I'm quite interested to ask without without spoilers. Um, even though I know this is an interview for me and not for you, but I did want to ask you when you said you thought Julian was bad. What did you think? I mean, at least in the beginning, you can kind of say, what did you think he did that that made you feel, huh? This is kind of an odd thing he did that. Maybe he's not so great. I mean, he's just um, not that he's necessarily a bad guy. I mean, from the from the outside, he did everything properly. You know, it's you know what I'm talking about. He did the right things. Yes. But um, I don't know. He just seemed lazy and he seemed kind of sneaky a little bit. And okay. I, yeah, and I don't really know why it just felt that way. Maybe the way he was pursuing okay. her, maybe. OK. Yeah. Okay. Like That's we'd hear what his okay. we hear what he's thinking, and then he says something else. So it's like, oh, he's so fake. <laughs> yes. Well, right, but it, right, exactly. But no, it's completely correct. It's it's the way people uh, because we know what's happening inside him. We're sort of aware of that sort of thing, right? Mm-hmm. And and so we, but but it's like we know ourselves where sometimes we're thinking, 
oh my, I don't like that person. And then we put on this smile and we say, hey, how you doing? How's everything today? You know, and sometimes we're bored and we fake interest. And sometimes we are, you know, judgy and we fake that we're, you know, being approving. So I think, again, as I said, I, I tried to make him to be somebody that we could relate to, mm-hmm. uh, someone who is quite, quite uh, human in the way that we can understand. Yeah, he definitely is. Um, and, you know, so is Josephine. We understand being in tight yeah. situations and she's kind of in one of those <laughs> to, you yeah. know, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, unfortunately. And, and which of us, and again, like I think to my own life and I think of the life of m- people that I know, how many of us have sometimes been in, in positions like hers, worse than hers, where you just are in a, like you said, in a hot mess mm-hmm. and you want to, and you want to do better and you just don't know how and you want to make everything somehow resolve itself and you just can't. Right. You know? And so, and again, and again, I mean, is she an ideal character? Well, no, by no means. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you want to know what we're talking about, you'll have to read the book. Yeah. But the thing about love, the thing is your love for someone is a real like thing. It's a living thing. And just because sometimes the people don't turn out to be the way you want them to be or the way you hope that they are, it doesn't really take away from your love for them. I mean, eventually it might if they continue kind of abusing you, right? Mm -hmm. Or if they continue to just breaking your heart or if they can. But how many people do you know who love people who are completely wrong for them and yet they they don't stop loving them. Right. And I think I wanted, I mean, that's the sense that I want to convey that there's something, there's something deeper that Julian feels for Josephine that's not going to go away just because she behaves poorly or behaves not in the way that he would like her to behave. Mm -hmm. As he says, as he says that his idea of what is perfect uh, sometimes she can't live up to because his idea is so high. She's up on such a pedestal for him that when she falls short of that is where their conflict comes, you know? Yeah. And that's something to remember. Nobody is perfect. And you maybe shouldn't put them on that pedestal. You really shouldn't because they're people, all of us. So, right. Yeah, exactly. So I would love to exactly. know, what did you like best and worst of both of those two main characters? Oh, uh, well, he, um, well, I, I just, I just, I, I think probably now that I have him in the fullness of my entire saga, it's very difficult for me to judge him just based on the tiger catcher, because to me, he is, just the embodiment of of so much that I I feel for him. I suffer with him. I love him. I'm in love with him. You know, there's nothing. I I laugh at his jokes and I cry at his pain. For me, he is he is thoroughly and completely real. But I think in the Tiger Catcher, what I liked about him is that he just seemed like someone who had stuff going on behind his calm exterior. That's what I liked about him. Like he just had something. He had something in his physicality that was going on and she clearly reacted to it too. She saw something in him, Josephine did, that was that where he just, he looked like a normal guy, right? He just was an average guy. He kind of dressed average and he, you know, made his hair kind of average. He tried not to be too ostentatious, but yet inside there was a fire burning. And to me, that was very appealing, very attractive. Mm -hmm. And her, well, she was just a complete delight. She was sunny and open and open and friendly and charming and flirty. She was beautiful. She had beautiful hair. She smelled good. When she smiled, her face lit up. As for a man to look at a woman like that, responsive to him, friendly to him, who wouldn't fall in love with her? She was just beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it was instant for him, too. It was just like, didn't take, she wasn't even speaking to him, but she thought she was speaking to him. It just never yes. left. Yeah, never left. Yeah. 
I did like the sections that included from the desk of Mr. Know It All. <laughs> Can you tell us just a yes. little bit how those kind you know kind of formed and how they 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 led nicely, I think, into each new chapter. Yes, I really enjoyed um, uh, uh, making those things to make him more real and to and to also so we had some idea of what he did for a living. You know that he wrote this newsletter where he made some hacks. This was his life. You know, he walked around LA and he looked for for great things, amusing things, interesting things. He looked for maybe some advice or maybe maybe some funny tidbits or uh, restaurants he liked or music he listened to. And he put that all into this blog. And clearly, uh, this was very interesting to the people who read him too. Um, and so I wanted, I didn't want to just talk about it. I wanted to see what that was like. It wasn't easy for us to come up with, uh, you know, we had to, you know, it's a graphic newsletter that had to be like basically an illustration inside the book. Um, but I really, really enjoyed, enjoyed uh, making that. You almost could make a whole book out of those. <laughs> you could, you could take was, that out. Yeah. <laughs> Some of his tips are pretty helpful. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and also, yeah. And plus others, some of them are funny. They're little, little quotes. And some of it, as you could see, as the story progresses, it gets progressively harder for him to uh, just be sort of normal and neutral and impartial, right? Mm -hmm. The way he was at the beginning. Absolutely. And so, uh, yeah, but, but so it's kind of fits into the story in that way, but um, yeah, but I really enjoyed, enjoyed, enjoyed making those. Awesome. So for you guys that don't know, the tiger catcher has been compared to Outlander and the time traveler's wife, which are both epic stories with a time travel component. So please, Paulina, let us tell us, how did you decide to make your time travel rules? Well, that's a that's a fascinating question, uh, Tamara, because as you know, uh, the the time travel rules are, as we now know, from Endgame and from and from and from uh, Game of Thrones, even that, and and certainly in in um, uh, in the Time Traveler's Wife and in Outlander, the way you get into the into the magical world is always different. Mm -hmm. The rules that are there are are always different. For me, for me, what was interesting is that they had a celestial connection, some kind of a connection of body and soul that connected them because clearly when something happened to her it happened to him right it ripped him away from her and so that was interesting to me so I like the idea and also one of the things I like the most is that I didn't I mean clearly time travel is a magical element right yes. but I didn't want it to be I wanted it to be my time travel to be grounded in in something real and in science, and also in a sense of adventure, which is why I made it so that he had to travel to her, mm -hmm. literally go on a journey, yes. that it wasn't just he touched a genie bottle and wished for it, and there he was, you know? Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be that simple. I yeah. wanted it to be difficult, and that, and that, and that each journey was going to uh, lead to to some discovery about her, to some discovery about himself. Um, so that to me, so those are my rules. My rules were is that I needed, I needed for Julian to, to, um, to be able to adhere to certain, uh, to certain rules of real life. So I wanted him to suffer before he, uh, before he, um, uh, went through the portal and, 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 uh, and went on his adventure. Uh, so that journey also needed to be his and a real journey. And I also wanted the the threads that connected them to be uh, severed so that when the threads of their connection was severed, they were uh, sort of wrenched away from each other. So those were two things that were that were uh, that were important to me. And um and I very much sort of wanted him to uh, walk lightly through the past and not change things that um, that would make it difficult for him to return or to 
live or to mess basically with the continuity of all things that he had no part of. So I didn't want him to, you know, to do various things where he, you know, stop wars and, 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 um, like I didn't want him to be the sort of the Connecticut Yankee and in King Arthur's court where he came in with all this knowledge and, and told everybody about, um, you know, about all the things that he knew from the, from the present time. Yeah. So kind of like, wa- don't mess with history. <laughs> right. So I wanted him to, yeah, to walk lightly and, and carry a, carry a small stick sort of a thing. Yeah. Awesome. So those were, so yeah, so those were, those were like my, 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 my the main things that I, I sort of adhere to the main rules mm-hmm. that I stuck to. Okay. So did you have any challenges, you know, whether it's research, writer's block, psychological things that, you know, you had that maybe you had some issues in bringing this series to life? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that overall, this was probably the most difficult thing that I've ever written. The most difficult. Uh, Because instead of writing one story set in one time and then kind of going through it. Like even when I wrote the bronze horseman, it was still the universe, the world of Russia, of the war, you know, it was in one place. I had to learn about that place. I had to research a lot of stuff about that place. Any of my other books, whatever they were, even my historical novels were still set, say in Boston at the turn of the century. So I needed to find out, things about Boston in the turn of the century. But in the end of Forever Books, I had to s- set it up so that so that there were several different um, uh, settings where I needed to research them and the story had to be new in them and the characters had to be new in them. There had to be a new thing that happened between my main characters. There had to be uh, a new resolution. There had to be new drama, new conflict. And all of it was on a different landscape. It was Mm -hmm. all at a different time. It was all with different people. It had different dangers. It had, uh, you know, it had different, uh, you know, story thematics and schematics. In other words, it all had to look different and feel different. And I had to do it not once and not twice, but um, several times. And this was incredibly, incredibly difficult because, as you can imagine, after I wrote The Tiger Catcher, I was like, OK, I'm done. I like, I'm mm-hmm. done writing the book. And yet the story wasn't done. I still had so much more story to, you know, to, you know, to write. And you will see that. You know, as you read through A Beggar's Kingdom and then, of course, An Expressible Island, it will it will just I myself, I just felt often really um, staggered by the difficulties, the emotional difficulties and the logistical difficulties and uh, of 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 writing of writing these books. And so the research was very complicated and the um, and the storytelling was was complicated. It was it was it was a very difficult process. Wow. So I bet that made the payoff when you were done even more sweet, even though you're almost done, technically almost done. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I am. I'm done certainly with the story. I'm just now perfecting the words. And as mm-hmm. we know, the work of perfecting the words is never done. But yeah. I am. I'm now trying to make it make it better. But but it's it's the story is already done. And certainly by the time that I finished An Expressible Island, I very much felt, and I hope that you will agree when you read it, that um that the story was earned, that everything that they had gone through, everything that they had suffered, everything that you're gonna read on these pages, that you will also I'm hoping that you will feel that uh they have earned that story that I've given them okay. or that they've given me. Yes. So before we move on, I would like to talk a little bit about the audiobook because I love audiobooks. I'm a huge audiobook advocate. And so I noticed that the narrator is Jeremy Arthur and he is going to narrate the entire trilogy. Yes. Cause he's amazing. He, he is, is. <laughs> amazing. I picked him out of a lineup, so to speak. <laughs> I have been given <laughs> him and uh, and four other samples, and 
Um, and they actually read a part of the tiger catcher. So I was able to evaluate them not only based on words from other books, but actually my own words about my own characters in my own book. So in, in because of that, it was much easier to to see where the emotional beats came and where they emphasized the right things or the wrong things. And he was just brilliant. He was incredible. I I think that you're going to he's going to he's it's like art when mm-hmm. you listen to him. Yeah. Did you get to work with him directly, like giving him some notes or feedback after he started recording or kind of you just let him do his thing? So I let him do his thing this time. He didn't ask. Sometimes they ask, like when they have very difficult names that they don't know how to pronounce, they'll ask. Like with the with my Russian books, for example, when we were recording them, I really needed to be sort of, I needed to tell them how to pronounce certain Russian words and the Russian names. But here, I think it was probably straightforward for him because I think he just was, um, I'm okay. And he didn't ask for any advice and I'm, I'm okay with that too. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm excited for that. I can't wait to get my hands on the audio book so I can listen to a little bit of it that way. So, yeah. Oh yeah. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be very special. Audio books is also such an exploding business right now. Right. I mean, it's just, just that people um, are able to listen to whole unabridged books now in their cars and when they're just doing housework or, or yard work. And so it's, it's an incredible way to be connected into the book world and yet still be in your, in your like life kind of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I believe your publicist is going to send me an audio clip. So everyone hop on over to the blog post if you want to hear a clip from the audiobook. It should be available. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. So is there anything else you would like to discuss about the End of Forever trilogy or the Tiger Catcher specifically before we do the lightning round? Oh, well, I don't know what the lightning round is. It sounds um, fast and exciting, but I, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, no, I think you've done very well. And I think I hope I've answered your questions unless you feel I've, I've, um, you know, not answered some of them, in which case I'll be glad to maybe amplify. But otherwise, I feel like we've done real well. Yes, you've done great. OK, so let me just tell you what the lightning round is. And it's super okay. easy. 60 seconds, 60 questions. No one ever answers 60, so don't worry. <laughs> what? Yeah. Wait, so I, I have to, so wait, I'm, so I'm listening to you ask the questions and I've got to immediately respond? Yes, you just answer as Yikes. quick as you can. <laughs> okay. So some are book related, some are not. Some are open-ended questions and some require you to pick one or the other. The only oh, one boy. rule I have is that you must choose on those. You can't say neither or both. I can't say not. I can't either. So I have, if you give me two options, I have to pick one of them. Yes, you have okay. to. <laughs> okay. And it's only a minute. So I'm going to start my timer. And when you're ready, we'll start. You ready? Maybe just five questions in a minute. Can we do that? Or maybe it's like <laughs> a Paulina lightning round, like a really slow really slow pace, calm, lighting red. Okay, I'm ready. Go ahead. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Read five pages a day or five books per week? Five pages a day. Physical books or e-books? Physical book. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Name a book that you've read in one sitting. In one sitting, um, Shop Girl by Steve Martin. If you were forced to live the rest of your life as one of your characters, who would it be? Tatiana. Beer or wine? Wine. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Oh, dark chocolate. Where is your favorite place to read? In my red chair. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Be a librarian or a bookseller? Bookseller. Early bird or night owl? Oh, night out all the way. What is, was your favorite book or series from your childhood? The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. And that's time. <laughs> oh, that didn't sound like 60. Yeah, it actually was oh. one minute and two seconds. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. all right. So we did well. Oh, I could have yeah. done those. That's kind of fun. That was fun. Yeah, it is. And it's super fast. It goes by so quickly. Yeah, that was fun. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for doing that. I loved your answers. Thank you, Tamara. That was great. It went real well. Uh, Everything was really good. I really enjoyed talking to you. Oh, thank you. Same here. So everyone, be sure to follow Paulina all over social media and pick up a copy of her book. Actually, pick up all three if you're listening to this in the future. (laughs) The links for book one, The Tiger Catcher, are below in the show notes. And again, it has been a pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you very much, Tamara. I really enjoyed speaking to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. And until next time, happy reading. Take care, guys. If you enjoyed today's book chat episode and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. Head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a positive five-star review. You can follow me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. Most importantly, you can share this podcast with friends and family that enjoy all things bookish, including author interviews. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading. Happy reading.